The Twelve Steps to Holiness and Salvation Chapter 5 Poverty and Detachment Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 3 When the masters of the spiritual life speak of poverty in spirit, they generally understand it in a twofold sense. In the restricted sense, it means a detachment of the heart from earthly possessions. In a broad sense, by poverty in spirit, they mean detachment from everything earthly, no matter what it may be. In this sense, poverty in spirit is necessary for all who are striving after perfection. Our heart cannot exist without love. It will either love God or creatures. If it does not love creatures, it certainly will love God. In order to become holy, we must therefore banish from our heart all that is not of God. When anyone came to the fathers of the desert and desired to be received by them, he was asked, Do you bring an empty heart that it may be filled by the Holy Ghost? And they were right. For a heart that is filled with the things of earth has no room for the love of God. He who brings a vessel filled with earth to the spring will never be able to fill it with water until he empties it of the earth with, his, with which it is filled. How does it happen that so many pray and go frequently to Holy Communion and still make no considerable progress in the love of God? The reason is doubtless because the heart is full of self-esteem, of vanity, self-will and attachment to creatures. He therefore who wishes to arrive at the perfect love of God must practice poverty in spirit. He must be detached from worldly possessions, from temporal honors, from his fellow creatures and from himself. Our divine Redeemer had said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And again, Woe to you rich! What does he mean by these words? Does he mean that all the poor are poor are happy and all the rich unhappy? Certainly not. He wishes rather to exhort all, both rich and poor, to the practice of the virtue of poverty and detachment. For there are many who are poor in the goods of this world, but their hearts cling tenaciously to the things of earth, while on the other hand, there are wealthy people whose hearts are entirely detached from their earthly possessions. The Poor in Spirit The poor of this world do not possess poverty of spirit from the mere fact that they suffer the want of the goods of this life. Poverty of spirit consists in the desire to possess nothing but God. I meet a poor man, says St. Augustine, and yet I find he is not poor. That is to say, many are poor in, re in reality, few in spirit and desire. St. Teresa says that they who appear externally poor without being so in spirit deceive both the world and themselves. What will their poverty in possession avail them? He who is externally poor but in his heart has an insatiable desire for wealth has only the burdens but not the virtue of poverty. The truly virtuous poor desire nothing but God and for that very reason they are immensely rich. Of them, St. Paul speaks when he says, Having nothing, they possess all things. But how can they who are rich in the goods of this earth still possess poverty in spirit? They can do so by having no inordinate attachment to their riches. What are the goods of this earth? They are really goods only in appearance that can never satisfy the heart of man. You have eaten, says the prophet at Jews, but you have not had enough. Instead of satisfying the hunger, says St. Bernard, they only increase it. If worldly goods could satisfy the heart of man, the rich and the mighty would be perfectly happy. But experience teaches the contrary. As a rule, they are the most unhappy of men, for they are tortured by fears, jealousiness and sadness. Vanity of vanities, and all is vanity. I have had all these things, said Solomon, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. And to this fact, the f that those who are always intent about, upon increasing their earthly possessions 
are in great danger of being eternally lost. The apostles warn us against this in his epistle to Timothy. They that will become rich fall into temptation and into the snare of the devil and into many unprofitable and hurtful desires which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the desire of money is the root of all evils, which some coveting have erred er er from faith, and have entangled themselves in many sorrows. If we desire to belong to God, we must renounce all attachment to the goods of earth. He who strives for earthly goods, says St. Philip Neri, will never become a saint. The riches we must strive to gain, says St. Prosper, are not temporal goods, but virtues, humility, meekness, chastity, piety. For these will constitute our greatness and glory in heaven. Let not up to ourselves treasures, lay not up to ourselves treasures on earth, where the rust and moth consume, and where thieves break through and steal. The wealthy can practice poverty in spirit by giving alms and performing good works. O oh, happy exchange, says St. Peter Damien, we, can we give earth and receive gold. That is to say, we give our earthly possessions and receive in return graces from God and an eternal reward in heaven. In all ages of the Christian era, there have been people of distinguished rank who lived in great simplicity in order to be able to perform good works. Violenta Polambra, a lady of the nobility, clothed herself in ordinary linen. Her rosary was made of cheap wood. Just before her death, she, were, she was heard to exclaim, Oh, what do I see? My dresses become brilliant and my beads are sparkling like diamonds. True Detachment Our detachment from the things of this earth is proved by our resignation to the will of God in temporal disasters such as financial loss by accident or theft. Faith teaches us that nothing happens without the permission of God. If, therefore, we suffer the loss of our good name or our temporal, committed, temporal possessions, God does not, of course, will the sin that is thereby committed, but He wills or permits the suffering that falls on our lot and He wills it for our good. When a messenger came to the pious job and announced that the Sabians had stolen all his belongings and murdered his children, the holy man replied, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. He did not say, The Lord gave, and the Sabians have taken away. But, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. As it hath pleased the Lord, so it is done. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Finally, we prove to evidence that we possess the spirit of detachment when we are ready to sacrifice everything we have riches, honors, dignities, position. In short, every temporal advan advantage rather than offend God. Such were the sentiments of the holy martyrs, Dacian, the governor of the province of Ta Tanijma, addressed the young deacon Vincent in the following words, My boy, you are still young. The smiles and favors of fortune await you. To possess them, all you need to do is to renounce your religion. Obey the emperor and escape an ignominious death. Vincent turned to Bishop Valerius, who with him stood before the governor and said, My father, if you wish, I shall answer for you too. The holy bishop, who stood prepared to suffer everything for the love of Jesus Christ, replied, Yes, my son, as I have already commissioned you to preach the word of God, now I commission you to confess our faith. Hereupon, Vincent declared to the governor that both Valerius and himself adored but one God and that they could not and they could not and would not adore devils, for such were the gods of the Roman Empire. Moreover, he said, Do not imagine you will influence us by threatens or promises. There is nothing in the world to compare with the honor and happiness of dying for Jesus Christ. Engaged at this fearlessness of the holy deacon, the governor cried out, Either sacrifice to the gods or your contempt will cost you your lives. The holy deacon replied with a loud voice, I have already told you that you could do us no greater favor 
than to put us to death for Jesus Christ. And you may rest assured that you will grow weary torturing us because before we are tired of being tormented. Let us now consider some of the means that are necessary for acquiring this detachment from things of the earth. In the first place, to remove all inordinate attachment from the heart, it is necessary to dwell on the thought of death. The day of death is called the day of loss, because on this day the riches and honours and pleasures of the earth are lost. On this account, says St. Ambrose, we should not really call these things our own, because we cannot bring them with us into the next world, where only virtue can accompany us. That man was right who, therefore, realizing the vanity of the world, wrote on a skull the following words. To one who thinks, everything here below seems deserving of contempt. But why are there so many unhappy lovers of this earth? Because there are so few who think of death. Poor children of Adam, says the Holy Ghost, why do you not banish from your hearts all earthly attachment? Why do you love vanity and seek after lying? What happened to your forefathers will happen to you. They do love the dwelling that is now yours. Now they are no more. They have gone into eternity, and you shall follow them. The Poverty of Christ The second means consists in frequent meditation on the poverty of Jesus Christ and the esteem which he had for this holy virtue. For our good, and in order to give us an example, our Divine Redeemer wished to lead so poor a life on earth that St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi called poverty the spouse of Jesus Christ. St. Bernard says, Poverty was not to be found in heaven, but it reigned on earth. Mankind, however, did not recognize its worth, and therefore the Son of God came down to choose poverty for his inseparable companion and to teach us to esteem it. This thought is in keeping with what the Apostle writes to his disciples. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that being rich, he became poor for your sakes, that through his poverty you might be rich. Although our Divine Redeemer was the Lord and Master of all the riches of heaven and earth, he willed nevertheless to become poor in this world, that through his example we might become rich. He wished to induce us to love poverty as he did, for poverty, by detaching us from earthly riches, enables us to share in the treasures of heaven. The third means consists in the frequent, in the frequent dwelling upon the teaching of our beloved Lord that the poor in spirit shall have a great and certain reward. Their reward is certain, for when our Saviour enumerates the Beatitudes in the Gospel, he referred in most instances to the future, as, Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. But to the poor in spirit, he promises happiness even in this life. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. While here on earth, they receive special graces. The reward of the poor in spirit is secondly very great. The less we have here, says St. Teresa, the greater will be our joy in heaven, where our dwelling shall correspond to the love with which we imitated the life of poverty of our Divine Master here on earth. The truly poor in spirit enjoy a heavenly peace even here in this world. Oh, what happiness voluntary poverty bestows, says St. Lawrence Justinian. The poor man possesses nothing and therefore has nothing to fear. He is always cheerful, for he always has an abundance, since he knows how to draw spiritual gain out of everything that is burdensome. According to the words of St. Bernard, a miser craves for riches like a beggar, because he can never satisfy his insatiable desire. He, on the other hand, who is poor from choice, despises the possessions of this earth and is at the same time the master of all. The fourth means consists in loving God without reserve. A soul that is thoroughly penetrated with divine love is inclined of itself, of course, not without the aid of grace, to divest itself of all earthly things which might prevent it 
from belonging entirely to God. For the love of Jesus Christ, a certain rich man had renounced all his possessions. When one of his friends asked him how he had fallen, fallen into such poverty, he drew forth the copy of the gospel and said, This is what has robbed me of all I, all I possessed. The Holy Ghost tells us that all the treasures of earth are as nothing in the eyes of one who loves God. If a soul directs all its love to God, that soul despises riches, pleasures, honors, kingdoms and everything else this world can give. It only loves God and says without intermission, O oh my God, Thee alone do I desire. He who loves God is not anxious to gain the esteem and love of men. All his efforts are directed to one end, to please God, the only object of his love. St. Hilary says, All earthly honors are things of the devil. Indeed, the devil is working in the interest of hell when he inspires a soul with a desire of the esteem of the world. For when a soul loses humility, it runs the risk of being hurled into the abyss. A great servant of God once said, When we hear that a Solomon or a Tertullian, these cedars of Lebanon have fallen, we have a proof that they did not give themselves entirely to God, but nourished pride in their heart, and on the other hand, strayed from the path of righteousness. We should tremble when we experience within ourselves the desire to shine before others and to be honored by them. Such promptings may be the beginning of our eternal misery. Many who have pretensions to piety and adorers of their own honor. They have a certain appearance of virtue and at the same time a desire to be praised for all they do. If no one praises them, they praise themselves. They wish to appear better than others and if they hear that their good name has been assailed, they lose all control of themselves, neglect Holy Communion and all their exercises of piety. They can find no rest until they have made good the supposed injury done to them. Such is not the conduct of those who love God sincerely. Far from praising themselves or taking pleasure in hearing themselves praised, they are disturbed on account of the recognition they receive, and they rejoice when they are called upon to suffer contempt. I am only that which I am before God, said St. Francis of Assisi. Of what, use it, of what use it is to be esteemed by men if we are contemptible in the sight of God? And what does it matter if we are despised by the world, provided we are acceptable before God? He who praises us, says St. Augustine, does not free us from the punishment we have deserved from our sins. And he who blames us is not able to rob us of the merit of our good works. O oh my God, exclaims St. Teresa, what matters it whether we are loved or hated by creatures, provided we are without blame before Thee? The only desire of the saints was to live in obscurity and contempt. What harm did they do to us who have a bad opinion of us? asks St. Francis de Sales. Should not we have just an opinion of ourselves? Is it right to wish others to think well of us when we know very well that we are wicked? A Hidden Life a hidden and obscure life affords great security to those who sincerely desire to love God. Our Divine Master Himself deigned to teach us by His own example, for He spent thirty years in the obscurity of Nazareth and the workshop of a humble carpenter. In imitation of their Divine Model, many saints withdrew into the desert and lived in remote caves to escape the esteem of men. The desire to put ourselves forward and merits the plaudits of men to be regarded as very successful in our undertakings is, according to St. Vincent de Paul, an evil which causes us to forget our God. It vitiates our holiest actions and more than anything else impedes our progress in the spiritual life. To be pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God, we must therefore banish from our heart the desire to appear before men to win their approval and applause, and especially the desire to rule over others. Inordinate ambition, writes Pleat Peter of Blois, imitates charity but in a perverse manner. Charity endureth all things, 
but only for the sake of eternal goods. Ambition endureth all things, but only for the wretched honours of this world. Charity is full of gentleness, especially towards the poor and despised. Ambition is full of gentleness, but only towards the influential of this world, who are in a position to satisfy its cravings. Charity believeth and hopeth all that pertains to eternal glory. Ambition believes and hopes in everything that leads to the vain honour and glory of this world. And granted that we obtain the supposed honour for which we strive, what have we gained? What else must a little smoke that usually, instead of raising us, lowers us in the eyes of others? Honour vanishes, says St. Teresa, in, in consequence of the desire we have had to attain it. The greater the honour we receive, the greater the disgrace for having striven for it. St. Jane Francis de Chantal says, The more worthy we think ourselves of some office or employment, the less worthy we are to have it. For we show that we are lacking in humility, which would be our best qualification. When St. Vincent Carafa of the Society of Jesus visited a sick friend who had just been appointed to a very important but dangerous office, the sick man begged him to pray for his recovery. St. Vincent replied, No, my friend, I will not be unfaithful to my love for you. Now that you are in a state of grace, God calls you into the next world, because He desires your salvation. Did He permit you to live? I know not whether you would save your soul in your new office. Hereupon, the sick man quietly accepted death from the hand of God and died with perfect resignation. True Detachment Detachment from human beings does not mean that we are to love no one on this earth, but it means that our inclinations are to be in accordance with the will of God and are unto pleasing to Him. Both nature and religion impose upon us the obligation of loving our parents, relatives and benefactors. But this love becomes inordinate and bad when it leads us to offend God and impedes our progress in a virtual li virtuous life. Many Christians would make great progress on the road to perfection where they freed from all earthly attachments. But because they foster some inordinate attachment in their hearts and are unwilling to renounce it, they continue in their lamentable condition without advancing a single step on the way of virtue. St. John of the Cross says, A soul that is attached to any creature will never attain perfect union with God, even though that soul may possess other virtues. It matters very little whether a bird is bound with a strong or a weak cord, for the bird remains a captive and unable to fly as long as the cord is not broken. It is sad to see so many souls who are otherwise rich in virtues and graces, but who never reach a perfect union with God because they have not courage to renounce some little attachment. All that is necessary is one generous effort to break the cord that binds them and constitutes the only obstacle to their happiness. To arrive at a perfect union with God, it is necessary, therefore, to be entirely detached from creatures. In particular, we must renounce every inordinate attachment for our relatives. Our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ tells us that he who is too much attached to relatives cannot be his disciples. And why? Because it often happens that we have no greater enemies of our soul than our own relatives. A man's enemies are those of his household. St. Charles Borromeo said that as often as he visited his, his relatives, he returned with less zeal for the glory of God. When Father Antony Mendoza was asked why he never visited his parental home, he replied, because I am aware that there is no place where religious so easily lose the spirit of piety as among their relatives. He who has truly renounced inordinate attachment for his relatives will not be immoderately cast down when death claims someone who is near and dear to him. There are many who are inconsolable at the death of a relative or friend. They weep and moan and deliver themselves up to such un unrestrained sadness and impatience that no one dares to approach them. I wonder whom they think they are pleasing by such unreasonable sadness and such a flood of tears. Is it God? Surely not. 
for God desires us to be resigned to his holy will. Is it the soul of the deceased? Again, no. For if that soul is in hell, it spurns those tears and the one who sheds them. If it is saved and already in heaven, then its greatest desire is that relatives and friends unite it in making thanks to God. If the soul is still in purgatory, it ardently longs for the prayers of its friends and perfect resignation to God's will, so that all may be reunited one day in heaven. To what purpose, therefore, such excessive weeping and lamentation? One day, when the venerable Theotine, Joseph Caracciolo, was visiting his, his relatives, who constantly bemoaned the death of his brother, he said to them, All, let us spare our tears for a mo more worthy object. Let us shed them for the death of Jesus Christ, who is our father, our brother, and our spouse, and who suffered death for love of us. On such occasions, we ought to imitate the pious Job, who, on the death of his children, said with beautiful resignation, The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. As it hath pleased the Lord, so it is done. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In the year 1624, the son of a pious Japanese was condemned to death. When the young man took leave of his mother, he spoke to her in the following words, Dear mother, at last the hour is come for which I have yearned so long, and for which I, I have so often prayed to God. I am now going to die. Pardon me all the trouble and sorrow I have caused you, and give me a mother's blessing. He then knelt to receive her blessing. His mother embraced him tenderly and said, My dear boy, may God bless you and grant you the grace to die a holy death. It pains my heart to lose you, but I am consoled with the thought that you die for Jesus Christ. May he be forever blessed for this grace he bestows on you. Hereupon, the young man betook himself to the executioner to receive the stroke of death. What a magnificent example of detachment from relatives! Resignation to God's Will Detachment, moreover, requires us to be resigned to God's will in the loss of those who are useful to us in our temporal or spiritual concerns. In this, in this regard, pious souls often commit serious faults by the want of resignation to the disposition of divine providence regarding their confessor. It is not confessors, but God who makes us holy. When he gives them to us, he desires us to profit by their sacred ministry in the affairs of our conscience. If he takes them from us, he wishes us to redouble our confidence in his goodness and to speak to him in this manner. Lord, thou hast given me this assistance, now thou hast taken it from me again. Thy holy will be done. Come thou thyself to my aid, and teach me what I must do to be faithful to thee. Jesus Christ is our true consolation, our true leader, our true love, yes, the only love of our soul. He does not wish us to seek consolation outside him. To be sure, God wills that we should never leave our spiritual director as long as we can have him. But when he himself takes him away, he will give us another or supply his assistance in some other way. Above all things, we must be detached from ourselves, that is, from our own will. He who knows how to conquer himself will easily conquer all other difficulties. It was this self-conquest that St. Francis Xavier so earnestly recommended to all who are striving after perfection. If anyone will come after me, says our blessed Lord, let him deny himself. The epitome of all we must do to become holy is found in a single word, self-denial. We must therefore love God as God wishes and not as we desire. But God desires our soul to be empty of everything earthly in order to unite it to himself and to fill it with his love. There are many who desire to attain a perfect union with God, but they are unwilling to bear the contradictions that God sends them. As long as they are not perfectly resigned to the will of God, there is no, no thought of perfect union. The way to union with God, says St. Catherine of Siena, leads through afflictions and sorrows. These are the means God uses to purify us from all evil inclinations. 
sickness, poverty, contempt, temptation and contradiction are permitted by God to give us an opportunity to battle against our inclinations and obtain the victory over our passions. According to St. John of the Cross, we must mortify our senses and desires. With regard to the senses, we must, from the love of Jesus Christ, reject every gratification that does not refer to the honor of God. For example, should a desire arise within us to see or hear things that are not calculated to bring us nearer to God, we must suppress such a desire. Moreover, our preference must be for the uncomfortable, the disagreeable and the bitter things that nature tries so, so hard to avoid. In one word, he who sincerely loves Jesus Christ will banish from his heart all attachment to earthly goods and divest himself of everything in order to be perfectly united to his blessed Redeemer. All his desires are centered in Jesus Christ. He is ever thinking of him, ever yearning of him. In every place and on every occasion, he wishes to please him alone. But to arrive at this sincere love, it is necessary to banish from the heart all inclinations and attachments that are not of God. What therefore must a soul do to give herself entirely to God? She must avoid whatever displeases God and do whatever is pleasing to Him. Secondly, she must accept whatever is sent her from the hand of God, however hard or disagreeable it may be. And thirdly, in all things, she must prefer the will of God to her own. In this manner, we make a complete and worthy offering to the heen of God.